Okay, I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about using ERDAP. And if you guys are interested in getting spatial data like this, like this big sea surface temperature map or maybe chlorophyll, um, ERDAP is a wonderful way to find and get and graph and analyze these types of data. So maybe you're a fisherman and you want temperatures or you're a student and you need data for your project. This is going to be useful for you. So. ERDAP stands for the Environmental Research Division Data Access Program. It was invented by Bob Simons at NOAA. And if you want to see Bob actually go through a, a really nice uh, video about all the features that ERDAP can do, I'm going to go ahead and point you there with this YouTube link. But um, we're going to be using some of these actual ERDAP uh, sites that have lots of useful data on them. Now, one thing to think about is that the most of the data that is in an ERDAP site comes in three dimensions. And those dimensions are longitude, latitude, and time. Sometimes there's a fourth dimension with depth, which we may get into. But one way to think about how this data lives out there somewhere is, is in a cube like this. And that might be on some server somewhere. Uh, maybe that server's at Delaware, or maybe that server's at NOAA, or wherever that server might be. ERDAP serves as the middleman to go in and query that data set and return it to you in a variety of different files. So that might be an image, that might be a CSV file, it might be an Excel file, it might be a NetCDF file, JSON, all different kinds of stuff. And so typically uh, the way people will use ERDAP is to one, just maybe just request the most recent data, right? So maybe this is a timeline here and just you want the most recent latitude and longitude. Maybe it's like a map for temperature or something like that. Or what you can do is go in and, and grab like this big cube of data here where you have latitude and longitude that you've subset and you say you want the full history or the time there. So then you want to do some, some sort of time series. So what I'm going to do now is, is come back here and I'm going to go to this ERDAP site. There we go. Here's the ERDAP site. And uh, this is one that we run at the University of Delaware. And so here it is. Here's ERDAP. And here's a whole list of things you can read about how the ERDAP site actually works. I'm going to leave that to you guys uh, to actually read on your own. This is just a real fast sort of uh, overview of what you can do with ERDAP. We have 46 data sets uh, online here, and there's all different types of data sets. Maybe this isn't super intuitive to you, but as you guys get to learn the lingo of, of what sort of data is available, this will become more familiar. So just one that we'll use here is uh, the MODIS Aqua 8-Day 1-Kilometer Composite from the Northwest Atlantic. And so the best thing to do here is basically click this graph data this thing and you can actually see where this data is coming from so you can see here's the most recent timestamp um, oops the most recent timestamp is from uh, um, October 2 and this is a eight day one kilometer composite so the way to think about this is that this is eight days of data basically averaged together You've got some missing data in here. That's where these gray spots are. And then it's served up to you, um, you know, in one day time steps. So you can go back one day, you know, or multiple days and see that. Now, here's the latitude and longitude range. Um, here we can mess with those. And then, um, you know, here's all the different products that are actually in there. Now, you can actually do research on your own of what these are. We're going to focus on chlorophyll. This is chlorophyll OC3 and this temperature product. That's what we're going to be focusing on. So let's go ahead and uh, show what you can do with a couple of these different uh, products here, right? So let's just, for example, let's just go to 2011, 11, the 30th of, the 30th of November, 2011. You can see the data is automatically graphed here. And you can come through here and you can change. Let's just move to SST here. You can hit redraw the graph and there it is, right? So there's the data that we might be interested in. You can see that the time slider moved here when I changed this, but you can also move this time slider wherever you want to go, right? So we can move back. We have the data all the way back to 2002 on this one. So it's a long time record. So we can move it anywhere in here. Here's 2019. 
um, you know, January 31, there's the data that's available. Now, this is a polar orbiting satellite, so there's oftentimes missing data in here. This is also, this is actually um, better than normal because we're using an eight-day composite. But let's just go back in here a second and go to, let, I'm sorry, 11.30. Let's redraw that graph. And you can also click on this, right? So if you want to click on the map, you can actually zoom in a bit. Um, so we can zoom in two times to get something like this. And let's suppose that's the data that you want. You can come down here to the sort of file type that you want to download. Right? So there's HTML table, there's CSV data, ASCII data, let, you know, MATLAB data, NetCDF data. We can come down here and just go to a large PNG. Go ahead and hit redraw the graph. I'm sorry, that wasn't right. Come down here to do large PNG and hit download data or image. And there it is. There's the data for SST. So that can be really helpful. And what's really cool about this is that this, this actually just generates the URL. So the this thing actually generates the entire URL that you can go in and edit and adjust this figure. So you can dump this into a web page anywhere if you want. Another cool part of this is you can actually download this as a KML file for Google Earth. So if you hit download and it comes down as a KML and then you can open Google Earth here. Here it is. So there's the data that we just looked at. And so we can get a sense for where that data is relative to anything else we might want to put into Google Earth, which is a nice feature. So one thing that's nice, once we start to view this data, is that we can say, let's suppose that we want to come in here real tight into, I'll just keep clicking in here. Let's zoom in by two times, zoom in again here into Delaware Bay. We can come in here and you notice that, you know, these are zooming in here too, right? The lat and the long correspond here. We can click on data access form. You notice the lat and longs actually come over with that, which is really nice. And we can ask for a series of data here, right? So we can go ahead and ask for, let's say 2011, 11, 30, 2, 2012, 11, 30. Full, uh, full year of data. We can collect any data that we want in here. So we're going to pull in chlorophyll and SST. And let's go ahead and generate a NetCDF file. This is a NetCDF version 3. Go ahead and hit Submit. And here it comes. So about 90 megabytes or something like that. Not that bad. So let's see what we can do with something like this in R. So here's my R Studio console. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, navigate over to where I downloaded that file. Set my working directory is going to be in, let's see, downloads down here. open so I'll just copy and paste that and put that in here and there's a couple of libraries that we're going to need to require we're going to require an etcdf4 and require fields these two you can install if you come over here to tools install packages uh, you can put NetCDF4 or uh, fields in here and make sure you install the dependencies. So let's go ahead and run that. And I'm going to start a connection. I'm just going to call it F as a file connection. NC, sorry, NC underscore open. And let's see if I look in my downloads. What is that file name?
Okay, this is the file name. So what you do with NetCDF is you actually open connections to the NetCDF file. So this is, uh, um, one, if I type F, the way that it works is it lets me look on the inside of what is inside this file. And if you want more details on the NetCDF, you can check one of my other videos on opening NetCDF files from NASA. But what we really want to know here are what the dimensions are. Again, we have latitude, longitude, and time. And so we can pull that in here. So let's go ahead and do F. I'm sorry, let's just call it TM for time. We're going to use the function NC var underscore get. We're going to pull from that file connection something called time. And you'll see that this is now, this turns out to be time in seconds since 1970, but we'll convert that in just a second. Our, we have a longitude equals C var underscore get F longitude, right? So we can run this. And you can see our longitudes that we've got. There they are, 162 different longitudes. And our latitudes, latitude equals C var get F latitude. Again, you can pull this data into Excel if you want. I'm just using R here because it's actually uh, much better at handling large data sets. And then we're going to go ahead and get our SST data. Remember, that's one that we selected. So if we hit F here, you can actually see it gives us a whole readout, all kinds of metadata that you guys are, may or may not be interested in um, about all of these data. So here's SST here. It's got dimensions, latitude, longitude, and time. And here is chlorophyll, CHLOC3. So it tells you what it's got ocean color. This is chlorophyll concentration. All right, so SST is going to be C var underscore get F SST and our chlorophyll be C var underscore get F CHL. So if we load those two, okay, it should be CHL OC3. Okay, both of those are loaded now. And let's take a look at the dimensions. Dimensions of SST are 164, 210 by 367. And if you see what the length of our longitude is, is 164. So that's like the um, x-axis, I'm sorry, yeah, x-axis. Our latitude, length of our latitude is 210, that's our second dimension, and the length of our time is 367. So that's a little more than a, little more than a year. That's our, our, this dimension. So we have the, our big cube, you know, here's our x, here's our y, and here's our z, or, or our time dimension. And so what we want to do here is maybe average over time. So just to check to see uh, what we have here, let's just take a look and do, let's go ahead and plot our SST. I'm sorry, let's do an image.plot of lawn, lat, and SST. We'll look at the first layer. There it is, there's our temperature. It looks like we got some temperatures that are a little bit out of bounds, so let's just go ahead and change that. ZLIM equals, this is just changing our temperature bounds. Let's just go from oh, 09 to 15. There it is, All right? So there's our temperature data. Um, in the bay, a little bit warmer outside, and we could do the same thing with our chlorophyll data too. So what this notation here means is, remember, we've got a three-dimensional data set. This is long, lat, and time. So it's just saying, give me all the longs, all the lats, the, the first layer in time. So we haven't specified what that layer is in time yet, but this is the, this is the first layer on the stack, or the first day that we downloaded. 
Okay, or you know, we can look at the tenth one if you want. So we can run that too, right? So it's going to look a little bit different. Okay, so let's, we can also do the same thing with chlorophyll, right? So here's CHL. Well, let's not do that. Okay, so let's suppose that we want to um, make a time series of this data. We want to average all this stuff over over time. Um, if we want to take all of these pixels in here and average them together in order to get some picture of temperature over time. Um, the first thing we want to do is take a look at our time variable, right? So remember I told you this was in seconds since 1970. So we're going to we're going to come up here. Actually, we might just do it up in here. Let's just go ahead and do time equals maybe we'll call it date in this case. equals as POSIX CT Okay, and all this does, this as POSIX, basically says, is telling the computer, this is POSIX time, so it's basically second since 1970, which is an interesting way to keep time, but that's the way that these files are written, is that uh, we're going to take our time, uh, we're going to put it in, we're going to tell it that the origin is 1970, January 1, 1970, and the time zone is GMT, and we'll go ahead and run that, and so now we can actually have real dates, right? So remember that we downloaded dates, the dates that we downloaded were from, you know, 2011, 1130 through uh, 2012, 1130. <clears throat> so that's where that, that's where that date is there. So we can now, if we want to, let's make a SST time series. In our SST time series, we're going to use the apply function. I want you to apply our SST object. We want to average over the third margin or preserve the third margin. We want to average everything else. That's what this means here. So we're going to take our SST. We are going to add, remember SST is a cube. We want to preserve that third date margin, right? So remember there's three, there's three margins, one, two, three. Take an average of that. And, and equals true. So make sure we ignore the NAs or the missing data. Okay, so there it is. Those are SST TS. Let's go ahead and plot our date in our SST time series. Our type is going to be O, and say our color is going to be red. Let's give that a try. There it is. So there is the temperature time series of the data, you know, in and around Delaware Bay. So we see that we see minimums somewhere in late February, maybe early March, and then they start to come up. Here we have our warmest temperatures here, you know, in late July, August, and then they start to cool down rather, rather quickly. You can also do the same thing with chlorophyll, right? So let's go ahead and Make this chlorophyll time series. Apply PHL. Basically the same function. And let's apply it. I'm just going to copy and paste this. Just make this our chlorophyll time series. And we'll make this green. Okay, right, so here we go. So it looks like the highest chlorophyll concentration is here kind of in the early spring, and then it, you know, is still fairly high in and around the bay. So still quite a bit of variability, not near as clean of a signal as the temperature one. But again, this is just a really quick run through to see what you guys can do. Uh, the combination of using R with ERDAP, which is uh, uh, really, really powerful. So I would encourage you guys to come back here to this grid DAP experiment, uh, poke around with some of these things. There's some really cool uh, temperature products and things like that that you can make images of, and uh, hopefully that's helpful.